Rob Venn here and we've got a bit of a brief introduction to genre today. Now this is something we'll look at in more depth when we get on doing section A of your FM2 exam stuff but I wanted to give you a bit of a, a brief introduction before we did the uh, section C stuff which is film noir which we'll start when we get back. So let's have a look a quick look at genre. Okay so what does it mean? Well, genre is a French word. It means kind, class, category, sort, style. Now, genre studies and film was something that was pioneered by the French film critics back in the 1950s. Now, until then, no one had really taken film seriously. It was a mass entertainment form. No one considered it art. But the French film critics wanted to study it as an art form. If it was an art form, it needed an artist. And who was going to be the artist? Well, they decided the director was going to be the artist. And thus was born auteur theory, artist theory, in other words. And they would study the films of great auteurs, great artists, people like Orson Welles, for example, and the great works of art that made film worthy of study. Which is all very well and good, but what about the vast majority of movies that had turned out year on year by the film industry not all of them are art hardly any of them are art so they're getting ignored well we need something that allows us to study those films and that's where genre theory came in we could look at films as a mass rather than looking at individual films particularly we can look at films that got things in common and we can analyze those so the two main approaches to this according to warren buckland in 1998 the classic descriptive approach, which is what most people think of when they think of genre studies. Um, but he also talked about a functional approach, which we'll talk about later. So with the descriptive approach, what we're doing is we're taking a bunch of films and going, right, these films have all got certain things in, cas in common with another. Therefore, we're going to shove them into this box here. And that box is the genre. Yeah, These films are all about the you know, expansion into the west of America in 1860 to 1890. They've got cowboys and Indians and horses and tumbleweeds and stagecoaches and cattle drives and saloons. They're going to be called westerns. I'm going to put them in the little western box. That's what we're doing. We're taking films based on shared generic characteristics, also known as uh, generic elements, repertoire of elements, or tropes. We're going to say, what these films got in common? We'll put them in this little box. That's genre studies in a nutshell, basically. But the functional approach talks about films as being cultural rituals. In other words, they reflect the society that made them. They reflect the industry that produced them. They reflect the fears, concerns, hopes, wishes of the audiences that watch them and the artists who make them. They don't exist in a cultural vacuum. So a lot of artists will talk about the fact that they, you know, they don't put messages in their films, but ultimately you can't escape the culture that you are living in. Any work of art is in some way going to reflect that culture. Uh, we'll talk about this in more detail later though. Now, what are the main genre categories? There are a lot of these. There are thousands of genre categories. But according to the British Film Institute, these are the main British genres. Action, adventure, animation, biopic, which is short for biographical picture. In other words, it's a film about someone's real life. Comedies, including rom-coms. Romantic comedies, that is, obviously. Crime movies, documentaries, drama movies, family, fantasy, horror, musical, romance, sci-fi and thriller. That's a very basic list, but in itself, it's still quite a controversial list. There are elements of this list you could argue about for hours. For a start, it's a British list, so it's not going to have anything on it like Westerns, because we don't make Westerns. To be honest, hardly anybody makes Westerns anymore, but you know. People still churn out the odd one. There are obviously other culturally specific West um, genres you'll get from other countries, like, you know, Chinese wuxia, you know, mystical martial arts films. We don't make any of them either. So this is particularly a British list. 
There are other elements of this you might take exception to. The WJC exam board does not like the term drama. As far as it's concerned, all films have drama. Well, yeah, and? It's still a noticeable category, a genre that people understand. You look at a film like Room. You look at a film like, I don't know, um, what have we got recently? Well, like I watched, um, I don't know, Shadow of the Serpent yesterday. What are those movies? They're drama films. They don't fit in any other categories. Other things that are a bit controversial here. Animation. Comedy. Musical. Are they genres? Are they styles? There are those who would say not genres at all. They're styles. You can have animated anything. You can have animated biopics. You can have animated sci-fi. You can have animated action. Animated horror. You can have crime musicals. Family musicals. Horror musicals. You can have... You know, comedy dramas, comedy thrillers. So are they genres? Are they styles? We treat them like genres. If you go to HMV, there'll be a comedy section. They'll, you know, so... Matter of opinion, you can argue one way or the other. People have been doing that for decades. How do we fit films into these categories, these genres... Well, Branson and Stafford talked about the repertoire of elements. You can talk about generic elements, generic tropes, generic characteristics. It all means the same thing. Um, I've split this into the descriptive and functional approach elements, which is not something Branson and Stafford did, but I think it's quite useful. So, first things, iconography. Things in the movie that are significant and represent other things. Um... It could be a simple thing like, you know, your mise-en-scene elements, basically. Your props, your costumes, your locations, your acting styles, your lighting, your colour schemes, all that kind of stuff. But it can also be things that are loaded with symbolism. You know, in a Western, a sheriff's badge is not just a piece of costume. It says something about that character, it represents certain values. Um, we can look at the style the aesthetics of the film. And that doesn't have to just relate to the image, it can relate to the style of music as well. So we can look at the lighting, the cinematography, the camera work, the editing style, all of these kind of things. So it's more, not just what's in it, but the way it's put together. Um, another part of the iconography, I guess, is the setting, the locations that are used. Are there any distinctive, generic locations we can associate with that genre? go back to the western we can have the saloon bar we can have the whole house we can have the telegraph office you've got the uh, monument valley you've got the deserts you've got the mountains you've got the forests indian camps you name it there's loads of different ones they're common to that particular genre same with characters vladimir prop in the 1922 book morphology the folk tale um, not to mention Joseph Campbell, um, also talked about generic character types. So uh, Vladimir Prop talked about the fact that all films will have heroes, they will have villains, they will have princesses, in other words, a damsel in distress, or at least some kind of object that the hero has to acquire. They will have the donor, the mentor, someone who gives valuable information or a magical object to the main character, things like that. So, you know, we talk about archetypes, classic, original models of things, in other words, or stereotypical kind of characters. Then you've got more functional approach elements. Like, now, now narrative sort of, like, fits into both. It's both descriptive and functional. So it's not just what happens in the story, but it's the way in which that story is put together. It's the way it's structured. But it's also the kinds of things that happen. Like, you know, in an action movie, you're going to expect to see car chases. You're going to expect to see fights. You know, they are typical things. You'd be disappointed if it didn't happen. If in a romantic comedy, you didn't have a meet cute. And, you know, that last minute dash to, you know, tell the person you're affectionate you love them. You know, you expect to see that in every single one of these movies. But you've also got the way in which the film reflects the society that made it. 
So we're talking about the themes. Now these can be universal themes. They can be law, law and order, right and wrong. Um, but they can be more subtle. So, you know, I remember seeing an interview once with George Lucas where he specifically pointed out the fact that he had been the original writer of Apocalypse Now and was in, he was originally going to direct it until um, Francis Ford Coppola and John Milius took it out of his hands. So he took the themes from Apocalypse Now and put them into Return of the Jedi. The Ewoks are the Viet Cong, the Americans being represented by the Imperials. It's a Vietnam War metaphor. Bet you didn't think that when you were watching Return of the Jedi, did you? But it's a theme. You know, people who were watching the film at the time may very well have picked up on that. Then you've got your audience responses. How are audiences going to respond to that? Remember I talked about that preferred negotiated oppositional reading stuff that people react to films and media texts in different ways. What's it supposed to say to us? How we, you know, what kind of a response are we going to? Are we meant to be scared? Are we meant to be f excited? Are we meant to laugh? Are we meant to cry? So, two different ways of looking at it, basically. But we're looking at what are these films all got in common? Horror films, for example, vary wildly from one another, but they're all designed to scare us. This fits into our audience response, doesn't it? But Warren Buckland also went on to point out the genres are fuzzy around the edges. They're not clearly delineated. Sometimes it'd be very difficult to fit films into particular genres. They might cross over into multiple genres and have elements of all sorts of different ones. Maybe they're so unique and so different, so original, you can't put them into a genre. Maybe they deliberately subvert genre um, conventions. So... It can be a grey area. They're not static. They evolve over time. Let's face it, one of the very, if not the very first ever full-length feature film was The Great Train Robbery, made in 1907 by Edwin S. Porter. It was a Western. But in those times, it was a contemporary movie. It was about stuff that was actually happening at the time. You know, you could make a Western about a train robbery today that could be in many ways very similar but would obviously be in many ways completely different to the great train robbery then we can also subdivide genres into even more specific categories called subgenres i mean you can see here is a small selection of some potential crime subgenres um crime comedies crime thrillers film noir Heist movies, hood films, legal dramas, mob movies, um, mystery films, police procedurals, heroic bloodshed movies, Mumbai Underworld films, detective whodunit films. I mean, that's a tiny fraction of potential subgenres of the crime movie. And these can be exceptionally specific. I mean, check out some of Netflix's genre definitions. They are really specific. But we'll also get films that will fit into more than one genre. We call these hybrid films. Alien, for example. It's a little bit of horror. It's a little bit of sci-fi. It's a little bit of action. Basically, it's a haunted house movie in space. Then you've got something like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Take your typical British costume drama based on a heritage novel from Jane Austen. But mix it up with some zombies. Bit of action movie conventions. And of course, this is not serious. It's a comedy. Multiple genres. Beauty and the Beast. It's an animation. It's a musical. Which we might argue are styles, not genres, but whatever. But also, a little bit of horror. A little bit of fantasy. A little bit of comedy. So... If all these films are so predictable, if they're so easy to put into boxes, why do we keep going and watching them? Why? Because people like predictability. They like to know what they're going to get. They want to know that the amount they're going to spend their time and hard-earned money on something that they're going to like. Think of genre movies as a mass-produced, manufactured product 
The film industry is just that. It's a film industry. It manufactures things on a large scale to appeal to the largest possible audience in order to make as much profit as humanly possible. They are, according to Barry Keith Grant, commercial products. Yeah, They're there to make money, not art. So, here's a good quote. Genre films are commercial feature films which through repetition and variation tell familiar stories with familiar characters in familiar situations. They also encourage expectations and experiences similar to those of similar genres we've already seen. In other words, we know what we like and we want to get a predictable response from the films we see. Genre films are like a Big Mac. Yeah, you had one Big Mac, you liked it. And you can pretty much guarantee that every Big Mac that you ever have will be pretty much a replication of that original experience. They might be slightly better, they might be slightly worse, but essentially you know what you're going to get. If you ordered your Big Mac and it had curry in it, you'd be surprised and probably horrified. Genre films are much the same. Predictable experiences. Patrick Phillips calls this comfortable reassurance. Yeah, they fulfill an audience expectation by being predictable. They follow predictable pans. You've seen one Roadrunner cartoon, you've seen them all. Doesn't stop them all being brilliant. You know that when Wile E. Coyote builds that Acme rocket sled, at some point he's going to go off the edge of a cliff. Yeah, we know that's going to happen. Doesn't make it any less funny when it does. What are we particularly after, though? What is that expectation we want? Well, Rick Altman talked about generic pleasures. Genres offer audiences a set of pleasures. The first one is the emotional pleasure. Does that text create, that film in this case, create a particular emotional response? All horror films are there to scare us in some way or another. Comedies make us happy. They make us laugh. Weepies make us sad. They might make us nostalgic. They might creep us out. They might turn us on, whatever. Emotional pleasures, that's what we expect from a particular film. Some films give us visceral pleasures. That's gut responses. Things you actually get a physical reaction to. Films that scare us so much we scream and almost want to wet ourselves. Comedies that make us laugh so much we want to wet ourselves. Films that are so disgusting they make us want to be throwing up everywhere. Action movies that are so exciting they make our heart pound. These are visceral pleasures. Films that are so sad they make us cry. A bit of a crossover there with emotional pleasures, obviously. Finally, we've got intellectual puzzles. Films that make us think. Is there a theme or an allegory going on that makes us think, ah, oh, I see what they're doing there. Is it simply a whodunit? Who are we trying to guess who the murderer is? So, you know. Or it could be a film that's a bit of a mind-bender. I mean, something like Inception, for example, which isn't as complicated as people make it out to be as long as you're paying attention. But it demands that you pay attention, otherwise it won't make any sense. So, we go to these films to get a particular predictable experience. We want to feel, or we want to think, or both. So, this is where the functional approach starts to come in. It's with our intellectual pleasure stuff. Sometimes films will address and reflect the values and concerns of society. They will reflect our worries, our concerns, our interests, our cultural values. Um, sometimes they will do this directly. Sometimes it will be through allegory, which is what I was talking about with that Return of the Jedi Vietnam stuff. Look at post-9-11 films. Now, I'll grant you, Cloverfield, as you can see, was made actually before September 11th, 2001. But it does not the fact that when the trailers for Cloverfield were hit in, the cinemas over here, this was about the time that 9-11 was happening. And I remember seeing the first trailers for this film and seeing, you know, the Statue of Liberty get decapitated and his head rolled on the street and thinking, well, it's clear what this movie's about. 
the fact that you know it obviously been written and produced long before the events of 9-11 it wasn't the first terrorist um, f- you know event that happened in America we'd had the world um, the World Trade Center bombs we'd had a, an earlier attempt to destroy the World Trade Center we'd also have things like the Oklahoma bombing so you know this kind of stuff was reflecting what's called PMT at the time pre-millennial tension or post-millennial tension in this case you know the millennium result in a lot of disaster movies and things like that being made but then you've got also films that are directly about that so you've got things like World Trade Center and Zero Dark Thirty um, whether it be patriotic flag waving America kind of stuff like Zero Dark Thirty or whether it be a much more British response with Four Lions which we do through parody and um, satire and humour so this is why audiences like genre movies what about the industry we've got to remember the film industry is a business and it's a risky business at that it does not make an awful lot of profit out of every ten movies you'll be lucky if six or seven of them lose money maybe one or two of them will break even and if you're lucky one or two of them will make enough money to you know reimburse you for the losses you've made so the film industry is just that films are made purely to make profit and they're made practically on a production line basis disney are the masters of this churning out pixar movies marvel films and now star wars films of monotonous regularity all based on standard set patterns this helps to make them cheaper quicker to make they're also made to a pattern that has a a track record of success marvel will keep making the same movie over and over and over again because they're successful it mitigates their risk on the other hand, generic conventions are also a really useful way to market films to audiences. You make sure that you put as many generic characteristics into your posters and your trailers and your other marketing materials as possible to attract the right audience. This is particularly being reflected nowadays by the importance of the franchise and the reboot. Most of these franchises are based on genre texts. No one is making franchises based on the Neon Demon. They are superheroes. They are science fiction. They are young adult post-apocalyptic dramas. These are the things that are dominating the cinemas at the moment. Look at Batman, for example. been making Batman serials. The New Adventures of Batman and Robin, The Boy Wonder. That dates from 1944. It was a Columbia serial. Rebooted in the 1960s with a TV series, which had a Batman movie. Very camp. Very funny. By the 1990s, you had Tim Burton taking it over, and it went all gothic and moody and dark, which is reflecting what was happening in the comic books with Frank Miller and stuff. Then Warner Brothers TV did the Batman animated series and its cinematic release, Mask of the Phantasm, still the best Batman movie in my opinion. Very much based on a 1930s film noir kind of Batman. Cracking thing. The darkness got even more dark with Christopher Nolan getting old of it and Batman Begins. And now they're going back to the comedy with the Lego Batman movie. They will be marketing Batman to audiences since the 1940s and they will keep doing it as long as it keeps making money. Marvel will still churn out superhero movies at a rate of one or two a year until people stop going to see them. They will keep making Star Wars movies until people stop going to see them. Sometimes this doesn't work. Nobody has yet managed to replicate the success of Harry Potter. Many people have tried. His Dark Materials cycle, for example, didn't work. Um, People tried to replicate the success of the Hunger Games. Nothing else came close. All this ties into the idea that genres are dynamic. They change over time. 
based on reflecting the changes to the society that makes them. A crime film today is going to look different from a crime film from the 30s. The Great Train Robbery from 1907, one of the very first feature films ever, is a Western. Modern Westerns are going to have very similar characteristics to that one, but equally they're going to look very different. So, this transformation goes through various stages called the Christian Mets. It starts with an experimental stage, then it goes to a classical stage. Then that will last for a while until people start taking the genre apart, making fun of it in the parody stage and just generally deconstructing it. That can happen pretty much simultaneously, very, very early in fact. I mean, sometimes you can go straight from an experimental stage to a parody stage, bypassing classical stage altogether. So, experimental stage. Somebody has to make the first movie in a genre or a cycle. They don't happen in a vacuum. They can take their ideas from novels, theatre, art, real headlines ripped from the news, whatever, right? But someone has to invent the generic conventions. Somebody has to be the first. So... You know, the slasher movie, the 1970s can owe its origin to films like, you know, Peeping Tom and Psycho back in 1960. Not to mention things that were really happening like the Ed Gein murders, for example. But someone has to create these conventions. So people generally consider The Stranger on the Third Floor to be the first film noir. It had all that chiaroscuro lighting, the light through the slatted Venetian blinds and all that kind of nonsense. It had everything we think of as being your typical film noir elements. So you'll have some experimental movies and then other people will go, well, that was a success. Maybe we need to replicate that. So what do they do? They look at what was good about that. They look at what was bad about it, what worked, what didn't work. They throw away the stuff that doesn't work and they keep the core conventions. They will then put that into other movies. If it works, they will make even more of them. And they will keep making them and keep making them and keep making them until they stop being successful. Eventually, these films will become formulaic and cliched. So The Maltese Falcon, for example, is one of the great classic film noirs. It's a remake. You know, somebody tried it before and it hadn't really worked, but it had enough there they thought it's worth keep trying this until it does work. Um, it had everything you'd expect a film noir to be. It's based on a Dashiell Hammett novel. It's got Humphrey Bogart in it. It's got your violence. It's got your private detectives. It's got your femme fatales. It's got everything you could possibly want. It's a classic in the cla you know the proper you know def definition of the term. But you know people kept trying to replicate the success until they got boring and cliched and formulaic. Here's where people might start making fun of it now. Steve Martin and the director Carl Weiner did a film called Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid in the 1980s which parodied the conventions of film noir. Um, this can happen really quick, actually. You can have, par you know, Scream, for example, got parodied by Scary Movie very quickly, even though Scream was itself a parody. So... The thing about parodies is they only work if the audience is very familiar with the generic conventions in the first place, otherwise they won't get the joke. Dead Men went, Don't Wear Plaid even went to the extent of taking footage from classic film noirs and intercutting it with modern comedy footage for comedic effect. But it also went to a great extent to actually really look like a classic film noir. Deconstruction stage films are where people start to literally take the genre apart, to deconstruct it and analyse the bits. So the classic example of this comes from the Western. Um, in the you know the classic era of the Westerns, you know, the cowboys and the cavalry were the good guys, the Indians were the bad guys. By the nineteen sixties, we'd had the civil rights movement, and people start to look at those old Westerns and thinking, wow, these films are really racist. Yeah. So you started to get films in which it was actually the Indians or the Native Americans as they came to be known were the 
heroes, and it was the cavalry and the white people who were the villains. Here we've got Robert Altman's version of The Long Goodbye, a remake of a classic old film noir that takes the conventions of the 1930s hard detective and dumps it into 1960s hippie Los Angeles in a kind of a fish-out-of-water story that had this, you know, relic of a bygone era starting to look like a bit of a, a misogynist. Parody and deconstruction are both examples of postmodernism, which I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's too complicated. But some of the characteristics of postmodernism are very much something you'll find in um, in genre movies. The first thing is self-referentiality. Self-referentiality is where films acknowledge the fact that they're movies, or they acknowledge the fact that they're part of a genre. Um, they will self-referentially use the generic conventions um think of things like breaking the fourth wall your brechtian befrems dung's effect think of um movies that are about movies or you might get things like um you know detective thrillers that are about people writing detective novels something like that this is self-referentiality we've also got pastiche um, which includes your remakes and your reboots, um, your parodies, and your intertextuality, a term coined by Julia Chris Avery in 1966. So let's look at what each of these means. Pastiche is an artistic work in a style that imitates that of another work, artist, or period. In other words, we're talking about, in genre terms, classical stage movies. It's where you take the standard conventions of that genre and put it into your movie. You're working to a template. Reboots, remakes, perfect examples of pastiche. Or you're imitating the style of something. You're making a modern movie that looks like an old movie. Or you're making... Oh, remakes, perfect examples of this. Parody, same thing, but for particularly comic effect. You're particularly exaggerating things in order to make fun of it, to lampoon it. Um, so you are making fun of it, basically doesn't mean to say that it's done in an aggressive way. It can be done in a very um, loving way. A good word to use here is homage, H-O-M-A-G-E, to copy something in a way that is honouring it, ripping it off. It's a posh French word for rip off, basically. Intertextuality is where one text directly references another one. It can be literally a remake. Or you can have a you know a film which you know Family Guy is full of you know look at Family Guy's um, something something Dark Side or something you know what I mean these are films that directly reference the Star Wars films like the Blue Harvest movies they're com Family Guy versions parodies of Star Wars perfect example of intertextuality. Here are some good examples. This is I'm going to use film noir as an example here. Um, Frank Miller and Robert Rodriguez's film Sin City is an almost shot-for-shot -shot recreation of Frank Miller's comic book. We can see on the right here some frames from the comic book being replicated almost exactly in the movie itself. So the film Sin City is a pastiche of the comic book Sin City, which in itself is a pastiche of the con conventions of film noir. Equally, we can take a film like Blade Runner, which took the iconographic visual style of film noir and applied it to the science fiction movie to create a subgenre at the time it was called tech, tech noir. Some of it's techno noir, but tech noir from the name of the nightclub in Terminator. But as you can see, we've got some classic film noir visual ticks going on here with the light streaming through the Venetian blinds and stuff with shadows and the chiaroscuro lighting. Or we've got a film like Seven, which is, in many ways, despite its violence and horror, a very old-fashioned movie. Look at this shot here of Lee R. Um, that, you know, he looks just like Edward G. Robinson in Double Indemnity. You know, that shot could be from an old 30s movie quite easily. Again, look at Morgan Friedman down the bottom here. 
you know, other than being black, which is something you wouldn't have got on a classic f film noir, you know, he's got the trench coat, he's got the hat, he's got the detective's badge, he could be a detective from an old film noir. Very deliberately old-fashioned looking movie. You've got something which really takes the generic conventions of uh, an old style and really pushes it. So you've got someone like the um, Batman Mask of the Phantasm, which has got a very, very 1930s Art Deco kind of look to it, which reflects the style of the original 1920s books. It's got a very kind of typical LA kind of 1920s architecture going on, but it also takes the chiaroscuro lighting, the Dutch angles, um, and the expressionistic imagery, which is typical of both film noir and, of course, German expressionism, which is a big influence on it in the first place. Then we've got your postmodern parody. I mean, they went to really great detail in this film to make it look like a classic old school film noir. The cinematography, the set design, the props, the costumes, everything very, very closely accurate, but done to make fun of it. And as I said, it even into cut sequences from original 1940s film noir and intercut it with the modern film for comic effect. So, classic example of intertextuality. So, that is a relatively brief rundown into genre. We'll go into it in more detail when we look at section A. But I just wanted to give you a bit of a primer before we started looking at film noir. If you've got any questions, you know where I am. And I'll talk to you next time.